Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our webinar participants. Uh, I really welcome you to this international webinar. My name is Christina Kraft, and I am Marketing Manager at the Draeger Werk Headquarters in Lübeck, which is in the northern part of Germany. And I welcome you to our webinar about optimizing perinatal transition and family integrated care practices in the delivery room. And our expert and speaker for today is already with us here in this call. So hello, Dr. Corley. Hi there, thank you. Hi, it's good to have you with us. And um, before you start, um, I would like to introduce you to our audience today. So um, Dr. Corley is pediatrician and neonatologist at the Evelina London Neonatal Intensive Care Unit in the St. Thomas Hospital in the UK. He has clinical interest in the optimization of early newborn care, thermal regulation and family integrated care practices, and being also a co-author for different publications exploring parental integration and communication, pandemic visiting restrictions, and delivery room cuddles for extremely preterm infants. Additionally, Dr. Cawley is also a re clinical research fellow at the Medical Research Council Center for Neurodevelopmental Disorders and the Center for the Developing Brain at the King's College in London, where he's also developing, investigating no novel high-access, low-cost, non-ionizing imaging techniques for perinatal brain development and neonatal brain injury. And today, uh, he will talk about um, how to optimize transition and how to facilitate also family integration already in the delivery room for ex extremely preterm infants, which has both uh, positive effects for the infant and the parents, but which is at the same time also a balance act between intensive care, resuscitation, medical needs, but the importance um, as well also of bonding and parental involvement. And he will talk about evidence and practicalities of this concept, as well as boundaries, priorities, safeguards, and practical tips in order to optimize transition and to best empower parents. And I'm really looking forward to your presentation um, as well as more than 1,000 people who signed up for this uh, webinar session around the world. And um, so there's ob obviously a high interest in your session. And um, I just saw that people from Canada, from the USA, as well as from um, um, Europe. So for example, a lot of people from Sweden, from Italy and the UK are joining today. So um, that's, that's really great. And it shows that there is a huge interest in your topic. Um, before we start, just two um, minor hints. So um, first of all, we will start with the presentation from Dr. Colley, and afterwards we will have a short Q&A session. And if you have a question, then please use the chat function in your webinar toolbar, which you find at the right-hand side of your screen. You can use there the chat or question function and just type in your question, and afterwards we will take the time um, to answer them. Um, with me is also my colleague uh, Lars Hertel, Regional Marketing Manager here um, at Draeger for the Region Europe, and he will moderate the session for you. Another point is, um, is that we will record the session, and um, you will get a link to the recording afterwards so you can watch the session again on the Draeger website. We will record the session, but um, your name will not be visible or anything private. So it's just um, the webinar presentation, which will be recorded today. Right. And um, I will now stop talking. And I'm really looking forward uh, to your presentation, Dr. Corley. And I wish everyone um, a lot of fun and a lot of um, different and interesting insights. Brilliant. Thank you very yes. much for the introduction. And uh, thank you, um, everyone who's, who's listening at home and uh, in the clinic. So um, I'll be talking to you today on optimizing perinatal transition and family integrated care in the delivery room. And um, I think for this really, I don't have any major disclosures. 
Um, as you heard, I'm funded by the MRC for some of my research, um, and I have a lectureship agreement with Draeger for this series, but um, the full proceeds are, are being donated to um, the Evelina Children's Charity. Um, and probably what makes me most qualified for this topic or to, to give this webinar is my previous work creating the first hour of care manual and um, also redefining uh, the ABC of neonatal care to um, airway breathing cuddles, um, which we put forward in our um, open access paper in, in Acts Pediatrica on delivery and cuddles. Uh, so I think we're all aware that a baby's first moments after birth are critical for both baby and family alike. And uh, infants who are born extremely preterm require specialised care to optimise their transition from womb to resuscitare and from incubator to parental embrace. Uh, whilst we are increasingly understanding the medical needs of infants born early, we must take strides to include parents at each step. Um, and early newborn care, even with the, within the delivery room, I think can be enhanced to facilitate parental bonding and attachment and empower parents at the start of their journey as their baby's caregivers. Uh, and I hope to show this through the course of this webinar. The benefits of parent infant contact for preterm babies, frequently practiced as kangaroo care, of course, are well established. But the dedicated and complex intensive care needs of the infant within the delivery environment um, do, uh, do form understandable barriers to parental involvement. So can the principles underpinning family integrated care be congruent with the intensive life sustaining support in delivery room? And can delivery room strategies focused on optimal perinatal transition be maintained or even enhanced by offering parents and baby alike their first embrace? So um, in the webinar, we'll explore some of the evidence and practicalities of early newborn care. We'll briefly recognize the global challenge um, that prematurity presents and the lifelong consequences that can occur for families and infants. Um, we'll focus on the needs of the extremely preterm infants and how current evidence aids our understanding of what optimized transition should look like from uterine to the ex utero environment. Um, we'll think about emerging evidence relating to fi care, kangaroo care, skin to skin care, and um, start to think about whether the philosophy of fi care and enhanced parent infant contacts can be facilitated in the delivery room um, while still maintaining those specialized needs of the extremely preterm infant. Um, we'll think about what evidence we have for supporting parent infant cuddles within the delivery room, what it means for parents, and how uh, the delivery room parent infant cuddle can be achieved practically with appropriate safeguards. Um, so to start off with, we'll, we'll look at prematurity and optimised transition, and I'm sure the audience will be well aware and well practised in um, the challenge that prematurity presents. It's a, a global challenge. Um, rates of uh, prematurity do vary globally from 5 to 18 percent, but 15 million babies are born preterm each year. And prematurity is the leading cause of death under five um, around the world. With uh, three quarters of these deaths probably preventable with um, relatively simple and current known interventions like warmth, breastfeeding support, and uh, basic measures to control infection and breathing difficulties. Um, if we think about extreme prematurity in particular, we know this has um, a very high associated mortality and in babies who survive, who are born extremely preterm, there is still high risk of, of moderate and severe disabilities. This is the British Association of Perinatal Medicine's um, patient uh, or parent facing chart, uh, which we use for counselling, highlighting that uh, there is a, a high risk of mortality, which whilst reducing with each week of maturity is still significant even at 26 weeks gestation. And again, the audience will be well aware that even in those who are surviving that don't have moderate to severe motor defect um, or impairment, there is still significant risk of cognitive um, impairment. So um, this recent publication in the BMJ showing rates of language, uh, mathematics and IQ are reduced for each week of immaturity compared to term counterparts. And a major challenge that we're facing now is that babies who are born extremely preterm go on to have a higher risk of psychiatric and conduct disorders. Um, 
So this chart taken from the Epicure study showing the uh, extremely preterm babies born in blue and term counterparts in red with higher rates of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, I think what this highlights currently is there are two imperatives we need to consider. Babies born extremely preterm, receiving active survival focused care need optimized perinatal transition um, and intensive care throughout their stay. Um, and that understandably parents of these babies who are born ex extremely preterm face immense psychological trauma and need significant support. Um, and the first part of this webinar will, will focus on, on the evidence for optimizing perinatal transition, but I'll just touch on this point now that um, understandably parents feel and face um, stress, helplessness, anxiety and loss of control um, through uh, having a baby admitted to the neonate unit. This loss of control and separation inhibits the establishment of a normal parenting role and infant parent separation risks the establishment of physical and psychological bonding. If we think about perinatal optimization, I'm sure um, uh, the audience here will be well accustomed to supporting babies born preterm. And of course, we can divide our perinatal optimization into a pre delivery or antenatal phase and a postnatal phase. Um, antenatal optimization, considering or, um, con uh, consisting of antenatal corticosteroids, magnesium sulfate, appropriate use of antibiotics if there's sepsis concerns in the mother ensuring that the baby is going to be delivered in an appropriate place, a, a hospital that has an appropriately skilled and staffed neonatal intensive care, used to uh, managing extremely preterm birth, and of course preparation of the perinatal team, including the parents, thinking about human uh, factors and counselling of the parents. Then in the postnatal phase, particularly the first hour, we've got to think about thermal control, optimal cord clamping, adequate but not excessive respiratory support. Again, appropriate use of antibiotics um, if infection is, is thought to be present or at risk of being present, and use of caffeine to prevent apnea and providing an energy substrate. So understandably, I think the thought which pops up in most of our minds is really there's a lot to fit in here. There are a lot of priorities for this baby, and where is the time for thigh care in the delivery room? Um, if you think about optimal cord clamping, there's going to be restrictions on the extreme preterm baby because of positioning. In terms of respiratory support, there may be lots of uh, nasal interfaces for CPAP or procedures like laryngoscopy and LISA, which are going to take time. And um, things like antibiotics, caffeine and energy substrate require intravenous access. Um, and then the other point, which is, again, um, well founded, that if we're going to introduce parent infant contact, if we're going to encourage a delivery and cuddle, are we at risk of compromising the very important thermal control of this preterm baby? So if we start off with thinking about cord clamping, uh, we've now got a really nice evidence base around this, um, this uh, meta-analysis from the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, published in 2018, shows evidence from nearly 3,000 infants that there's uh, a reduction in mortality when babies are offered optimal cord clamping more than 60 seconds. Um, and if we focus on those born extremely preterm, we can see that there's, again, significantly reduced hospital mortality uh, with a number needed to treat around 20, so, so not high. If we think about some of the methods used in these trials, particularly if we focus in on this, this largest and um, extremely well-performed um, antenatal Percental transfusion study, um, it showed that um, again there was reduction in uh, mortality. And if we look at their methods, we can see that they defined delayed core company as 60 seconds. Um, and critically, in this case, they held the infants as low as possible below the introitus or placenta. So we are limited within preterm babies as to the positioning of the baby and I think probably during optimal core clamping we wouldn't have evidence to support that raising them up to the maternal chest for instance um, would, would, would um, mitigate the, the benefits of delayed core clamping. It probably is different in term babies, we know that they can go to the maternal chest during this but in extremely preterm babies the trials that give us the evidence of reduced mortality tended to position the baby low down. If we think about airway and breathing, 
Again, we want adequate and not excessive respiratory support. Most preterm babies will breathe during transition, but the presence of respiratory stress syndrome may restrict their alveolar, alveolar aeration. So in infants without asphyxia, um, we usually just need a supported transition rather than resuscitation. And so infants should be gently transitioned whilst exposing them to the minimum number of interventions possible that of course could cause harm. Um, I like this observational paper from the Journal of Pediatrics. They examined videos of more than 60 extremely preterm babies and um, they observed the babies who breathed or cried spontaneously after delivery. And you can see even in the, the most immature group, those born less than 26 weeks, um, a half of those had some degree of crying and nearly two thirds um, had evidence of breathing. Um, not saying that that's effective to um, sustain and that they wouldn't need respiratory support, but um, they weren't apneic. So that tells us that in preterm infants, often CPAP alone is ideal and routine positive pressure ventilation should be discouraged um, and should be provided gently to those babies who appear apneic or bradycardic. Uh, and indeed, we've got um, a meta-analysis from 10 years ago, which shows that CPAP is superior to primary intubation in those less than 32 weeks um, for death or uh, evidence of chronic lung disease in nearly 3,000 infants. And the authors of that meta-analysis concluded that one additional infant could survive to 36 weeks without chronic lung disease for every 25 babies treated with nasal CPAP in the delivery room rather than being intubated. Um, and there's the forest plot for um, the various trials contributing to that meta-analysis. Um, what's more um, is, of course, the use of less invasive surfactant administration or Minimally, minimally, minimally invasive surfactant therapy versus standard surfactant administration, we're starting to get some evidence that this may be beneficial as well. Um, again, this showing composite death or bronchopulmonary dysplasia at 36 weeks, favoring the use of less invasive surfactant administration. And um, I think we don't quite have the granularity for this data, um, but this uh, systematic review hints that um, early use of surfactant, um, particularly within two hours, leads to reduce risk of pulmonary injury um, rather than delaying or waiting signs. Um, so I think prompt use of RDS, uh, surfactant to treat RDS where the baby's likely to need surfactant um, is likely to be beneficial, but um, something that we need to study in a bit more depth. And this is another lovely observational study um, they looked at the tardy volumes babies received during their assisted transitional resuscitation and they divided babies into those who had received less than six mils per kilo or those who had received more than six mils per kilo and then looked at evidence of brain injury on routine ultrasound and um, in 165 preterm infants mean age, gestational age of 26 weeks they found that the incidence of um, interventricular hemorrhage was higher in those who received um, the higher tidal volumes. And this uh, persisted when considering the severe grades of IVH grade three and four. So um, an observational study, not, not causation, but worth noting. And what these studies tell us is that um, certainly optimal cord clamping and the way we manage these babies' airways and breathing um, have a real impact on what happens next. And they're absolute priorities um, and uh, need to, the baby needs to be stabilized uh, from an airway and breathing point of view before we consider passing them over to the parents for a cuddle. Um, and if we think about the particular problem of neonatal hypothermia, again, the audience will be aware this is a global problem. Um, Preterm infants are, of course, are at particular risk. Um, hypothermia can cause metabolic derangement, hypoglycemia, acidosis, inhibits the production of surfactant, worsening RDS, and has a strong association with mortality. Um, this very well referenced paper from JAMA shows this association. Um, we can see uh, this graph here showing admission temperature on the x axis and the rate of composite outcome on the y axis. The composite outcome being mortality, severe neurological injury. ROP, NEC, 
chronic lung disease, no nosocomial infection, or need for ventilation. Um, and the bottom of this curve, the trough of the curve, associated with the lowest rate of this composite outcome, occurs between admission temperatures of normothermia, classically described as 36.5 to 37.5. The good news is that hypothermia um, uh, can be avoided with simple solutions. Simple solutions are effective. We know that uh, plastic bags or wraps when used in association with radiant heater um, can maintain a poor temperature with only need, four babies needing treating, an incredibly low number needed to treat. And in larger babies, skin to skin care, um, those 1.2 to 2.2 kilos is also effective in reducing hypothermia. Um, one thing that I also recommend and, and use within the delivery room is continuous temperature monitoring. I think it could be a real game changer. Um, I've got a video here just showing that we've got a skin temperature probe which can be placed on the baby using low adhesive um, tape. Um, my favorite position would be to position it under the axilla, normally attach it after the sat probe is put on, and after a few moments of um, equilibration, normally we see the temperature reading come up. And then we can either use servo control or adjust the uh, power of the radiant heater and other means to ensure we maintain this baby's temperature and we have a continuous eye on it. So um, another thing, if you're not already doing that, I would thoroughly recommend. Uh, and this is just some local data which we shared at the um, Joint European Aid Societies a couple of years ago. Um, you can see that uh, in 2019, after the introduction of continuous temperature monitoring, switch to a pointer, hopefully you can see this, um, we had a far higher rate of normothermia than historical comparisons. Um, even after in 2016 when a care bundle was put in place to maintain thermal regulation, it wasn't until continuous temperature monitoring was introduced that we really got on control of normothermia, um, uh, which I think, you know, from a brain injury point of view, even hypothermia should be avoided. So let's think about parent-infant contact uh, in the delivery room now. Uh, we are, of course, in an enlightened era of family integrated care. We recognize that optimal health outcomes are achieved when the baby's family play an active role in providing emotional social and development support. And this active role of parents in providing such support should really start right from birth in all babies. Um, and enabling a delivery room cuddle is an ideal way to promote the partnership between parents and healthcare professionals from the very outset. Um, and I think we'll see that allowing mums and dads the chance to cuddle their baby before NICU admission um, has many benefits to this partnership uh, and potentially for the baby and, uh, and family. If we think about direct skin to skin and kangaroo care, it's well known that you get physiological and behavioral stability, studies showing better thermal stability, better sleep, better breastfeeding rates, earlier discharge, and better growth and development. And then from a maternal point of view and paternal point of view, you have more positive feelings towards the baby, lower stress, and more confidence in meeting the baby's needs. Um, and frequently, if you think about the delivery room, the baby will be in a plastic bag. Um, it's not hard to imagine that even if there isn't complete and direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, um, these benefits very early on um, are likely to be replicated. Um, I think this is a really um, good point to have a listen to the parent voice, and I've got an animation here shared with one of the parents um, I've worked with. Um, it's a really powerful message, um, and um, I'll give the stage now to the animation. They say from the first time you hold your baby, you will never be the same. Your life changes. The love you feel and the emotion is overwhelming. When you have an extremely premature baby, you wish with all your heart that you could experience that flood of emotion the moment they're placed in your arms. You would give anything to hold them the way you have dreamt. Most mums of premature babies don't have the opportunity. They may have to wait weeks, months, or may never get to hold their baby while they're still alive. At 23 weeks pregnant, I was expecting twins. Charlie was shown to me and taken away to the neonatal unit, but was still in labour with his brother Jack. 
Jack had a more difficult birth and it took some time to intubate him. This was extremely distressing for us. Once Jack had been stabilised, the consultant asked me if I would like to hold him before they took him to the unit. I instinctively knew this wouldn't be something I'd get to do again any time soon. Holding my baby in my arms was one of the most special moments in my life. He was so tiny, so perfect in every way. Never in my life have I been so proud and felt so much love. I was completely overwhelmed with emotion. Would any mother turn down a chance to hold their baby for the first time? Jack died from an infection after only 11 days of life. The only other time I got to hold my baby was as he died in my arms. I still find it difficult to speak about to this day. But the cuddle I had when he was born is something I will treasure forever. Jack's twin brother Charlie very nearly didn't survive. It's been a long journey to get him where he is today. He's a happy, healthy and crazy little boy with so much character. He's now 14 years old. Since the birth of my sons, I've been told that being able to hold your premature baby isn't something that every consultant offers. And to be honest, this surprises me. I needed to tell my story to raise awareness about just how much that first cuddle means as a mum. 14 years later, and this still isn't common practice. So I'm sure you agree a really powerful story and one that um, Emma's very brave for, for sharing. Um, and that this story highlights the imperative to practice uh, delivering cuddles for the highest risk babies. Um, we know it's not common practice. Um, on NICU admission, extremely preterm infants are immediately incarcerated and shackled to multiple items of equipment. Uh, and they're words from parents, not my own words. Um, and if a cuddle isn't allowed before NICU admission, it can often invariably mean that it may be weeks before a first cuddle is possible. Um, I think initial contact between parent and infant is incredibly important for the extremely preterm risk because they are at the highest risk of dying. And I think it's a tragedy if the first cuddle is offered only as a baby is dying. Um, and we know that some parents out of sheer grief can't hold their baby in such circumstances. So I think a disaster for all if the baby dies suddenly and is never held by their parent. Um, how common is this practice? Uh, this study in uh, relatively moderately preterm infants between 28 to 33 weeks in Sweden showed that around a third of mothers and fathers were able to hold their baby in the delivery room. And uh, an explanation given by the authors for why this uh, may be so low is that, of course, infants may need immediate intensive care treatment. Um, but they postulated, of course, that it's possible staff are following conventional guidelines for medical and nursing routines in the initial care of preterm infants um, and are not considering the importance of first contact um, even when it is possible. Uh, and this uh, paper from BMJ Open um, in the U from the UK study, um, more immature babies in the population down to 24 weeks showed that no um, parent had touched their baby um, until they were on the NICU. And uh, it also highlighted that the first time parents hold their babies are often weeks after birth. Um, what evidence do we have for parent infant contact? Well, I think a large catalogue of evidence spanning decades for kangaroo care and skin to skin care on the neonatal unit. Um, I give this example from 1991, um, decades ago, showing the physiological effects of a kangaroo care in very small babies, so down to 770 grams. And this paper established that babies can be physiologically stable during cuddling with stability in their behavioural states, temperature, passenger breathing, oxygenation, heart rate. 
And um, if we think about all core setting, this meta-analysis for kangaroo care showed that kangaroo care can reduce neonatal sepsis, increase rate of exclusive breastfeeding, and uh, in babies showed improved pain measures, oxygen saturations, head circumference and growth. Um, and there's a forest plot, again, identifying a reduced risk of mortality um, in all resource settings, so low resource combined with high resource uh, for kangaroo care. Um, this paper um, is a particular favourite of mine. Um, it's 20 years following the RCT from Colombia, where they randomised babies to traditional care or kangaroo care. And 20 years later, those babies who had been randomised to kangaroo care showed reduced hyperactivity, reduced aggressiveness, reduced socio-defined conduct, and had better school attendance, had uh, larger uh, volume metrics on their MRI imaging, and uh, in those in employment had a higher salary of around 60%. So really highlighting the long-term impact of the way we care and show care um, for babies on the neonatal unit. Um, biologically, there's now several papers looking at EEG during skin-to-skin -skin contact, and um, these replicate um, findings of uh, enhanced sleep wake cycling and evidence of accelerated brain maturation. And when you put this all together, um, the European Foundation for Care of Newborns has highlighted that skin skin care is of particular importance for very preterm infants, and that skin skin contact should be initiated as soon as possible as standard care. Um, so that's thinking about kangaroo care um, and skin to skin care on the neonatal unit. We are starting to see increasing evidence relating to delivery room cuddles. Uh, this case series of 10 preterm infants from 28 to 32 weeks identified that the delivery room cuddle was a strong uh, positive means for babies and their families, and that this early contact helped with bonding and was uh, a form of stress relief for parents at a traumatic time. Uh, this observational study um, in babies with known antenatal surgical defects um, identified that more than half of them received a delivery room cuddle within their centre. These included some defects such as congenital diaphragmatic hernia and open surgical defects. Um, in the babies who were cuddled and not cuddled, no adverse incidents were um, identified, but those babies who received liver and cuddle received more breast milk than those who didn't. And I think within the surgical cohort, of course, we know how important breast milk is. We've then got two very nice randomized control trials. This first one in 55 babies in um, infants from 28 to 34 weeks. Um, and they looked to randomize immediate stabilization on the maternal chest with skin to skin contact for a whole hour versus immediate stabilization on a resuscitator. And um, the infant group who was stabilized on the maternal chest and kept there for an hour were marginally cooler at one hour than those immediately taken to the resuscitator by about 0.3 degrees, um, but did not identify any other um, adverse incidents. And in this RCT of 88 babies going down to 25 weeks gestation, they randomized infants to skin to skin contact um, versus five minutes of visual contact. Uh, within this RCT, babies who required intubation or more than 40 to oxygen were excluded, um, but those who did receive skin to skin care in the delivery room for 60 minutes actually had a higher admission temperature than um, those in standard care who only got to see their parents. Um, and uh, interestingly, they found combined maternal infant response behavior was higher in the skin to skin group. And importantly, they identified a lower risk of uh, postpartum depression and impaired bonding in uh, mothers who received a delivery room skin to skin cuddle. And then even on follow up at six months of age in this cohort, um, those who received direct skin to skin contact had better quality of mother child interaction responses, which was the trial's primary outcome. So authors concluded in this study that diverum skin skin contact promotes maternal child interaction, reduces maternal depression and bonding problems, and may benefit preterm development. Um, in this paper, um, babies down to uh, extreme preterm birth, uh, both intubated and not intubated, uh, were observed in a case control, and um, there was no significant difference in 
uh, time to admission, uh, admission temperature, survival to discharge. And in fact, if you look at the numbers, although not statistically significant, curiously, those who received cuddles actually had um, a lower admission time than those who were shown only to their parents. And if we think about the mother's views, experiences and memories of these events, um, uh, a cohort um, spanning a couple of decades were invited to participate in a historical survey. And in those who responded, 83% of mothers who received a delivery and cuddle um, vividly remembered this. And on a scale of zero to 10, they rated it at 8.6 uh, of importance to them. And they were asked how important it was to consider um, delivery and cuddles being offered to all babies by doctors and nurses, and they rated this 9.2. Um, and some of the parent contacts within that paper are, are very, very powerful. You can see here this uh, mother of 26 week twins, highlighting that relief, sorry, get my pointer up, hopefully it's up, relief, love, instant closeness, frightened but knew there was nothing my husband and I could do, and best leave it to the experts. Um, this one of 26 week boy, incredibly important as I did not get to hold my son again for two weeks as he was too sick. The cuddle helped initiate my breast milk supply and I was able to express and eventually breastfeed my son when he was strong. So conclusions from this paper were that with appropriate safeguards, delivery and cuddles are feasible, achievable, um, irrespective of birth gestation and the facilitation of the cuddle is an early important family centered practice which seems much appreciated by parents and which may improve bonding lactation and maternal health. Um, so if we think about the practicalities of the delivery room we know there are many risks I think a lot of them are relating to human factors and it's important we recognize the effect of the individual organization and, and environment and control for this. If we think about factors intrinsic to the infant, of course, we've covered many of this. Baby has a high surface to area volume ratio. They have an um, absence of insulated subcutaneous tissue. They have wet skin and they have limited um, internal thermoregulatory means. So all this, of course, means they're at risk of hypothermia. Additionally, there will be a degree of factor deficiency in premature lung architecture, which means they're at risk of respiratory instability. And they have limited energy stores, which particularly combined with hypothermia will place them at risk of hypoglycemia. But with appropriate safeguards, these are all risks which can be mitigated and controlled. Um, so really the process for a safe driven cuddle um, in all infants, but particularly extremely preterm infants, starts with that pre-birth, pre-delivery phase. You need planning, planning, preparation, preparation. Um, perinat perinatal optimization, as we've touched on, delivery in the appropriate centre, use of steroids and magnesium, identifying potential delivery complications from the maternal history, um, appropriately preparing equipment and assigning roles, talking through a mental model of how the stabilisation is going to go and preparing the room, um, if possible ensuring a high ambient temperature and certainly minimising any drafts and then of course including parents in the counselling um, and if this is something your centre is going to offer um, discussing this process with parents can be incredibly powerful as well. In terms of birth and stabilization, I would uh, probably advocate that I think, uh, as we've seen, things like cord clamping and respiratory stability are incredibly important, and that needs to be solved before we go on to the realm of de delivery and cuddle. So um, I would, uh, before the cord is clamped, place the baby in a sterile bag. Um, if you've got equipment which allows this during delayed cord clamping, of course, you can offer respiratory support, um, such as PEEP or positive pressure ventilation if needed. And um, then after cord clamping, establishing appropriate observation with pulse ox, continuous temperature monitoring, and then very importantly, establishing definitive respiratory support and achieving stability. Um, from centre to centre, exact practice will vary, but of course, we've seen that nasal CPAP is incredibly effective at establishing um, the uh, baby's residual volume, um, ensuring we're keeping them warm. If they need intubation and ventilation, doing so. If they need surfactant and Lisa, doing so. And then also, I think, good practice to cite a gastric tube to uh, uh, decompress the stomach if needed. Once all this is done, we're in a position to assess the suitability of the baby for a cuddle. Um, we need to see that they're stable, so they're maintaining their oxygen level. Um, 
there's the potential to increase the oxygen if we need, if there's any deterioration, we've got a stable heart rate, we've got a stable temperature, and we've got a definitive respiratory support, whether that's non-invasive or invasive. Um, the other thing I'd recommend if the baby is intubated, of course, is catnography um, for safety of that tube position. We need to think about if there's any caution or contraindication for doing the cuddle. Um, and importantly, and I've put this in red and kind of re-highlighted it, um, we're not going to move this baby unless they are normally thermic. If we're moving a cold baby, they're going to stay cold or even get colder. If we move a baby whose temperature is appropriate and ensure we've got adequate means to maintain normothermia, we'll maintain normothermia. Um, and in this, the practicality would look moving the baby in the plastic bag onto the maternal chest. So we've got the maternal chest as a heat source and then covering the baby with warm heated towels um, to prevent loss through conduction and convection into the outer room and environment. So prior to cuddle time, good to have a checklist. Have we got a stable infant, a stable airway, definitive respiratory support? Have we optimised our thermal regulation and we've got no contraindication? Important to involve the surrounding team, be that the midwife, anaesthetist, or obstetrician. Remembering that many of these uh, colleagues may never have seen a preterm infant being cuddled, and they too can help with the logistics of maintaining this cuddle. Ensuring the parents are ready and updated and mentally prepared. And this may also be an opportune moment to weigh the baby because then, as a team, you've got the weight, you can start preparing all the medications and infusions and prescriptions. Um, during the cuddle, if you're doing this, it's important to stay with the parents. Um, you're going to have to stay there to support the baby anyway. Um, reassure the parents you're there. They're stable for the cuddle, receiving optimal care. The baby is continuously monitored and safe. The baby is comfortable and receiving all the medical support they need. So you're continuing the respiratory support, you're continuing all the observation, and you're continuously monitoring them. And then this precious moment really um, is an opportune moment for parents to get photos and videos to capture it and they can then use these photos and videos for those hours after the baby's admitted to the NICU um, to help support them. So cuddle time, um, important of course to make sure we've got adequate power and gas supply. Um, I'll have a couple of diagrams in the next couple of slides but we can either move a transport incubator over to the mother or we can bring the baby on a resuscitator. Um, it's important to have an experienced team lead to maintain situational awareness within the group, and use closed loop communication, and there should always be someone ensuring the airway is secure and, and supervised. Um, good, so all that um, is available in the Act of Pediatrica open access publication. It gives a little mini guide for how to give a safe delivery and cuddle, along with a summary of some of the evidence. And um, if we think about diagram wise, if we've got access to a transport incubator, you can stabilise the baby on a resuscitator, move them into the transport incubator, and then move the transport incubator to the mother's side. I think some of the benefits of this, of course, are that some transport incubators have quite sophisticated ventilation. So if the baby's intubated, we could probably do targeted tidal ventilation. We could use a humidifier to deliver humidified gases. And we could have things like syringe pumps and things if we've cannulated the baby um, to provide dextrose or antibiotics. Slightly less sophisticated, um, potentially, but also very powerful and very easy to do would be to move the resuscitator back to the baby. Again, some resuscitators have inbuilt ventilation. If not, you can use the TPs to adjust PEEP and provide IPPV as, as needed. Um, but again, I would highlight that we need to be continuously monitoring this baby and always providing whichever respiratory support the baby needs during the cuddle. Um, so this is a picture of an example special moment between the um, parents and the baby being cuddled in the delivery room uh, using a T-piece and peep valve to ventilate the baby and then um, I've got a video now of an example of an extremely preterm baby born at 22 plus six weeks. Sure. 
we've got the saturations. 95. Yeah. Well, it's 170. Yeah. Super. You've grown it very well, Mummy. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Very good job there. You would have a huge kick on all that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's early days. So what we'll do when we get around, we need to put some special limes in, tummy mm -hmm. butter, so we can give him some sugar solution mm -hmm. and then some liquid feed as well. Okay. And really important will be, are you planning to breastfeed? You thought about that? Yeah. I'll be really crucial if okay. I can get work on you know, overnight, mm -hmm. get some milk expressing, and then we can trickle that down to the We'll be doing an x ray to check the position of the lines. Okay. Um, so here we go, minute to minute, hour to hour. So far, so good. We, we couldn't hope for a better you know, state of him to start with. Super. A good weight as well. We'll wait when we get around. Yeah, do you know what? We don't lose weight yet. Okay. Um, but since we get around, we'll be able to weigh in and then uh, let us know what it is. So you can see a very powerful moment, uh, and I think also a very calming moment that uh, mother holding the baby is a chance for the team to collect their thoughts. Um, I think in that video you saw some examples of excellent communication between the team, talking about the baby's observations, and also involving the parents in that and interacting and reassuring them. Uh, so units who are not doing this, who would look to implement, I would advise agreeing a guideline, implementing training and simulation prior to um, uh, doing it for real, um, then offering babies big and small cuddles, and then you'll be well rehearsed for when the tiniest do come. Uh, I think it's important to have a whole MGT involvement, obstetricians, anaesthetists, midwives, nurses, and have local champions to stoke enthusiasm, disseminate knowledge, problem solve and troubleshoot. Um, and of course, audit and governance for any implementation is important to make sure this has been implemented appropriately and, and safely. Um, so to conclude this webinar, we know that preterm birth is common and can have serious consequences for baby and family. Optimised transition is incredibly important for what happens next and uh, on the face of it really is quite simple looking at optimal cord clamping, optimal thermal regulation and adequate but not excessive respiratory support. Um, measures to implement optimised transition can be successfully continued throughout a delivery and cuddle and really represent good practice. Um, the provision of delivery and cuddle is important to many parents. It's likely to have beneficial impacts on stress, anxiety, bonding, breastfeeding, and parent-staff relations. Um, and uh, I feel that wherever possible, parents of preterm babies should be given the chance to hold their baby um, following initial stabilization, rather than seeing them whisked away. Um, we know decades, decades, decades later that mums still talk about how their, their baby was taken away without them holding them or without them seeing their baby. Um, safety first, of course, though, um, deliver and cuddle should represent ongoing intensive care. It should be directly supervised, assiduously monitored. Good communication is essential to make it successful. Um, I really must acknowledge uh, my collaborator and mentor, Professor Paul Clark, um, for the development, promotion of the deliver and cuddle. Um, much of what I've shared, we've presented together. And thanks, of course, to um, my parent co-authors, Emma and Sheila, who are really very brave um, and doing a great job in, in spreading the word. And a very special thanks to parents and preterm babies um, for their vital support. Thank you from my perspective. I'm just listening or uh, seeing here now in the chat that a lot of people are uh, writing some thank you messages. So brilliant, uh, really informative. Um, um, people join from all over the world. So we have people um, sending here thank you messages from Germany, uh, from Munich, um, from Sweden and so on. So 
I think it was a really um, insightful presentation, so thank you for that. And I really love to also hear the voice from the parents. And um, that was really great. And if you have any questions, then just let us know and write us a message. Um, I guess we would be, and you, Dr. Corley, also interested um, to, um, to hear more feedback. So if there's any, then just let us know. And um, with saying that, um, we would like to close now the webinar and wish you all a good evening or a good day um, wherever you are. And thanks again, Dr. Corley, for this really great presentation. Thank you very much. Really appreciated the invite. You're welcome. Thank you and bye-bye.